Greetings. Welcome to our monthly Hungry for History program. I'm Luciana Spraker with the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives. This month, I'm pleased to welcome Rita Fulce Elliott to share with us how archaeology can help us learn about people too often overlooked in traditional history. I encourage you to provide feedback on this program as well as ideas for future programs and speakers by emailing us at archives at savannahga.gov. You can also watch previous Hungry for History programs by visiting our website at savannahga.gov slash educational resources. Before we dive into our program today, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Ms. Elliott is Education Coordinator and a Research Associate with the Lamar Institute. She holds an MA in Maritime History and Underwater Research from East Carolina University. She's an archeologist, exhibit designer, and museum curator with over 30 years of archeological experience in 14 states, the Caribbean, three US territories, and several countries. Rita has led crews in the archeological discovery of the 1779 Savannah battlefield, has authored over 80 monographs, and has served on professional committees at the state, regional, and national levels. She is the former vice chair of the Georgia National Register Review Board and was named an honoree by the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation, Georgia Commission on Women. Ms. Elliott received the Joseph Caldwell Award for Georgia Archaeology, the Georgia Governor's Award in the Humanities, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Southern Campaigns of the American Revolution. We were also fortunate to have her expertise help us out with the Kleski Embankment Stores interpretation panels, and she did great work um, with the city over at the Coastal Heritage Society site at the Savannah History Museum. We are honored that Rita has joined us today to share her knowledge and expertise regarding how archaeology can help expand our understanding of Savannah's history. And now I'll turn it over to Rita Elliott. Thank you, Luciana, and hello, and thank you for your interest in Savannah archaeology. Uh, I would like to thank the City of Savannah Municipal Archives and their director, Luciana Spraker, for the opportunity to share this with you today. So without further ado, we'll get started. Did you know that archaeology is the only way to learn about 97% of human history? It uncovers the story of Native Americans for the past 12,000 12, plus years. It also uncovers those silent in the history books, women, children, the poor, the illiterate, the enslaved, and others. Archaeology discovers both important and everyday events of the past that have become forgotten. Archaeology also clarifies biases in the historical record. This presentation looks at a few examples of how archaeology can discover those underrepresented in Savannah's fascinating history. Imagine Savannah long before the arrival of General James Oglethorpe in 1733. Archaeological survey uncovered the presence of Native Americans along what is now Bay Street. They bluff overlooking the Savannah River, Native Americans ate oysters and threw down the shells amid the pottery 1,200 years before the town was even established. Native Americans realized long before Oglethorpe that the steep bluff and the Savannah River provided the perfect place to live, fish, harvest shellfish, and travel by vessel. If you think about Savannah in the 1700s, do you think warfare, civilian casualties, nationalities in and around the city? In September and October of 1779, soldiers of British, French, German, Haitian, Irish, Native American, Polish, and Scottish heritage converged, converged upon the small colonial city in three armies. French and American forces bombarded British-held Savannah with, with cannonballs and firebombs during this major battle of the American Revolution. The siege and resulting battle on October 9, 1779, turned the city into a scene of deadly urban fighting, with civil, civilians injured or killed in the process, and houses destroyed throughout the town. Archaeologists uncovered lead musket balls and French gun hardware within fortification trenches used during the battle. Excavations revealed actual locations of key points of the battle for America's freedom right on Savannah's doorstep. 
Archaeological excavations discovered the British fortifications at the Spring Hill Redoubt in what is now Tricentennial Park, and also the Central Redoubt fortifications in what is now Madison Square. Investigations revealed that the battle encompassed a much larger area than just Spring Hill. This archaeology provides place-based history revealing exactly where these tumultuous events occurred while connecting us to the nation and world at large. Archaeology also has discovered additional information about Savannah's early entrepreneurs and tradesmen. Archaeological excavations in the yard where Isaiah Davenport lived uncovered, uncovered stories about the 19th century carpenter and his large family. Archaeologists discovered and excavated his privy or outhouse full of construction debris, broken dishes, bottles, and animal bones. This revealed evidence of his family's life as Isaiah became upwardly mobile. Isaiah advanced economically, moving from a wooden house to the fancy brick home he constructed that we now know of as the Davenport House, the catalyst for historic Savannah's preservation. Archaeologists also uncovered information about the enslaved African Americans who lived on the site, who helped build Savannah through Isaiah's trade and kept Mrs. Slark Sarah Clark's Davenport's household clean and fed. For example, artifacts in combination with documents reveal the life of an amazing African-American individual named Nancy, who was a petite, feisty woman who spoke English and German and ran away in search of a better life. While the privy was full of information about Davenport house site occupants, it also cut through another exciting Savannah story. Archaeologists discovered that when Isaiah had the privy made, workers dug through a deep layer of broken hand-blown bottles and other 18th century artifacts. Archaeologists recorded the depth and the location of the layer and its artifacts. They overlaid this information on historic maps and discovered that before Columbia Ward was established in 1799, the lot that Isaiah would live on served as a dump for Savannah residents in the 1740s through 1770s. This was one of the city's earliest and accidental time capsules. Savannah archaeology also has uncovered Gullah Geechee culture. Excavations at the Abercorn site near Savannah's Georgetown area uncovered part of an 18th century house built by enslaved African Americans using traditional African construction techniques and local materials. Through careful excavation, archaeologists uncovered a rectangular stain in the soil. By drawing a map of the trench and the circular and square holes near it, archaeologists uncovered how the house was made, its shape, and its size. They excavated the trench that had been made to support the house walls, and the stains where posts that had been put along the trench and house corners had rotted. Archaeologists realized this was an earth fast house built using construction methods traditional in many African countries. Careful excavation and documentation revealed a previously unknown and significant Gullah Geechee story. Archaeological excavations on Skidaway Island uncovered evidence of the Catholic Benedictine monks, monks chapel and monastery constructed in 1878. The Benedictines also started a free residential school there for African boys who farmed and received lessons at the site. The students were strictly disciplined and had a rigorous schedule. None of the almost 500 African Americans living on Skidaway Island at the time were Catholic, and local Baptist ministers discouraged them from sending their sons to the Benedictine school. In addition, many freedmen and women preferred their children to learn clerical and other white collar skills rather than farming. These issues, in addition to a fire and possible tidal wave, contributed to the end of the Benedictine school and monastery around 1889. Archaeology prior to the construction of Hope Six Homes on Savannah's Walberg Street shows us a snapshot of history there. This area was originally one of Savannah's outlying colonial farm lots. The lot was owned in the 18th and 19th centuries by various people, including the Russells, the Tatnells, the Habershams, and the Wileys. By the early to mid 19th century, Abram and Anna Harmon lived there and had eight children. In spite of this, by the 1860s, Anna was calling herself a lady of leisure in the census records. 
Excavation uncovered many other previously unknown details about the Harmon household, including their children. The one cent piece shown here was notched and pierced, then strung on a piece of string, creating a toy. When the string was twisted and released, the coin made a whistling sound as it spun. But low tech toys back then. Another item archaeologists found was a silver nipple for a baby bottle. Ironically, babies were lovingly fed with this style bottle, later known as murder bottles, due, the con due to the concentration of bacteria in the hard to clean nipple. Archaeology has also brought to light a feature not seen for more than 150 years and associated with Savannah's role in the American Civil War. This is the CSS Georgia ironclad ship intentionally sunk by fleeing Confederate soldiers upon Union General William Sherman's taking of Savannah in 1864. Recent archaeological excavation and raising of the CSS Georgia was conducted in the Savannah River near Old Fort Jackson. This underwater archaeology is providing new data on what the mystery vessel looked like, the number and size of its engines, how its design resulted in its function, as well as the horrors of everyday life aboard the stifling, hot, humid iron box. This information reveals ship construction technology, economics, and materials in ship construction, and how they differed in the South and in the North during the mid-19th century. Archaeology has also uncovered important information about Savannah's industrial past. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, the railroad was one of, the, one of Savannah's major employers. The central of Georgia, with its roundhouse and related shops, was a huge industrial complex. Archaeological excavation there has uncovered the transfer table, illuminating how workers moved railroad cars into and out of the paint and coat shops for construction and refurbishment. Here you see the foundation of the transfer table uncovered by excavation. Other excavations throughout the railroad complex provide details about the devastating fire that occurred in the carpentry shop in 1923. Archaeological excavation of each soil lens and the artifacts they contained reveal the story of the shop's construction, use, destruction by fire, rebuilding, and reuse. Other excavations below the four floorboards of the tender frame shop exposed 657 bottles, mostly liquor flask bottles with a mean date of 1949. Historical documents from the Central of Georgia Railroad expressly forbade employees drinking on the job. Each three foot section beneath the building's wooden joists was photographed and made into this mosaic image you see here so that the locations of the bottles could be recorded. And if you look closely, you can see each one of those little specks is an individual bottle, one of the 657 bottles under there. Archaeological excavation in the neighborhood just outside the front gate of the railroad complex paints a vivid picture of life for white and African-American laborers and for white office workers living in the shadow of the Central of Georgia Railroad. Fish hooks and fish scales reveal how residents supplemented their diet. Glass bleach bottles suggest a small scale laundry business. Archaeology in the railroad ward reveals the stories of women in the neighborhood selling soft drinks and sweets to workers walking to and from the railroad complex, of children playing in the yard, and of poor Irish immigrants battling illness, working at the railroad complex, and subletting rooms to family and strangers, all to forge a better life for themselves and their children. Lost to history in an unmarked plot in Laurel Grove Cemetery, archaeology located Marquis Coart and brought his family's story to life. Marquis was a dentist who received his license in 1905. His first wife bore nine children, including three sets of twins. Archaeology discovered and brought Marquis, his family, and their history to life. How does the archaeological information about those not represented in history reach the public? Here are a few tangible products that bring this hidden history to light. They include a children's book about the Abercorn site, a community of enslaved, then free African Americans in Savannah's South Side, also a related curriculum for fourth graders. 
Other products include documentaries, such as this one about raising the CSS Georgia, related curriculum. Another example, another curriculum example is based on archeology span of the Revolutionary War Battle of Savannah. Other examples of sharing archeology span information about those underrepresented in Savannah's past include a teaching trunk for K through 12 students and a poster about the CSS Georgia project. Savannah archeology span produces real information about the past, often and not contained in history books. This accurate information provides tourism entities, exhibit designers, historians, and residents unique content, content about what happened in the past. A few examples include a museum exhibit in the Savannah History Museum and markers and interpreter signage about the international battle in Savannah during the American Revolution. Another example is and Skidaway Island that shares information about the archaeology of the late 19th century Benedictine monastery and school for African American boys. Archaeological sites provide opportunities for the community to get involved in uncovering those people and activities lost in history. The Schinholzer Leadership Institute was told that the Kluski embankment next to City Hall was used to hold enslaved people. The high school members of the Institute pressed city policymakers to change the way they managed the site. The city partnered with archaeologists who discovered no historical or archaeological evidence to support this claim. Archaeology did, however, uncover multiple uses of the vaults, including using it for the late 19th century mapping of the Savannah River Harbor through a complex telegraph and triangulation system. The youth group's civic activism was responsible for, for discovering the real use of the vaults, closing them to parking, and erecting four interpretive signs that share the new information with tourists and residents daily. Festivals provide enjoyable ways to share archaeological information with the public. The CSS Georgia Raise the Wreck Festival attracted 1,500 visitors, the majority of whom were residents from Chatham and surrounding counties. The festival offered a chance for the public to visit and learn about the underwater archaeology of the ironclad vessel itself and what it can tell us about those who made and used it. Archaeological information about those lost to history is also shared through public tours of archaeological sites, such as this one at the Abercorn site, teacher workshops for K-12 educators, such as this one for the CSS Georgia project, and public presentations. Archaeology provides opportunities for the public to learn about all those people underrepresented in history books by seeing it firsthand and learning about it through a variety of products. Savannah archaeology discovers and tells everyone's history. Each new archaeological excavation contributes important, unique snapshots to Savannah's album of our collective past. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. That was great. Um, I have uh, one question. If there are people who want to learn more about some of these local Savannah uh, projects, is there anywhere that they can find some of the final reports? Well, they, there are many places. Um, one place, if you go to the Lamar Institute, the lamarinstitute.org, um, there's over 200 reports about archaeology, and many of them are Savannah reports. Um, also, if you go to the Savannah Archeolo Archaeological Alliance, I think they may have some reports posted there. Um, if you go to Digging Savannah, the uh, Georgia Southern University uh, has, I think, a Facebook site that talks about archaeology in Savannah. So there are several places you can start off with. Um, just for local Savannah archaeology, those are some good places to check out. Great. I know uh, for the Kluski Embankment um, uh, stores or Kluski vaults, as some people call them, the one that the Schinhoster group worked on, we have all that information on the uh, Municipal Archives website. So if you're interested in that project, um, of course, you can go down to the vaults and see the panels in person, or you can go on our website at savannahga.gov slash municipal archives. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out today to share some of this information about archaeology and how we can use it as just another tool in our toolbox to learn about Savannah's unique history and all the people 
that were involved in um, building Savannah and making Savannah what it is today and what we get to enjoy. So I think it's important to recognize how archaeology plays a unique role in um, learning about and sharing that history with our citizens and our visitors. So I want to thank you for, for, for uh, coming out in, um, or coming out or coming online today to share that, that information with us. So I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you very much, Chai. It's my pleasure. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. And we look forward to seeing you next month for another Hungry for History. Mm -hmm.